Howdy, everybody. It's me, Mr. Moffitt. Um, I wanted to have you guys read a short um, introduction to the philosophy of Emmanuel Levinas, a French Jewish philosopher, um, an important one in the post Holocaust world. Um, but everything I found was still pretty advanced and uh, required of us you know, readers to have a background in ontology, phenomenology, metaphysics, these pretty dense philosophical concepts. And I felt that I, I couldn't reasonably expect uh, college freshmen who don't have a background in these concepts to read. It's pretty dense. Um, even fellow philosophers complained about how uh, hard to read Levinas was. So. I decided to go ahead and just make this short video to introduce you to some ideas because these are going to influence, um, or I, I want to look at media through and culture through his, through a lens of his work. First, let me give you a little bit of background on on Levinas. He was born in 1906 in Lithuania, and was raised in a very traditional Jewish home. Uh, his family spent time in Lithuania and in Russia. Uh, so he spoke several languages. He attended universities in France and in Germany and became a French citizen in 1930. During World War II, he fought with the French resistance against the Nazis and was captured. He was a prisoner of war. And I believe because he spoke Russian, he was able to hide from them the fact that he was Jewish but he did have family members who were killed in concentration camps. After the war, he settled in Paris and became a professor of philosophy and a director of a, of a very highly regarded Jewish school. In 1973, he became a professor at the Sorbonne, which is considered one of the best universities in the world, right there in Paris. He published many books and articles on philosophy and Jewish theology and other topics. And he died on Christmas Day in 1995. Levinas disliked that most Western, or European and American, philosophies took the self as the starting point of all understanding and perception. Many philosophers acknowledged that this perspective leads us to think of other people as if they were reflections of the self or something to be known, a puzzle to be figured out. This relationship to other people has a certain cost associated with it, though, namely a tendency to try and dominate others because they are different, and that difference is usually a source of negative feelings or discomfort for us, ranging from simple discomfort all the way up through anger and hatred. We struggle to free ourselves of this discomfort. Even in love, we tend to try to control our beloved, to make them more like us or to satisfy our own wants with their existence. We somehow try to overcome the discomfort of their other otherness through controlling them. I've put this painting up here because it kind of demonstrates this, this tendency. It is a self-portrait of a male painter holding a painting of his wife and daughter. His fine clothing indicates that he has attained a certain level of status or wealth. In this way, the image he holds becomes a kind of showing off, like his clothing and his medallion. Look at me, look how successful I am. He is using the image of his wife and daughter, who are others, as symbols of his own power and influence. Ultimately, this desire to dominate others or to make them more like ourselves leads to great suffering, including war, colonialism, slavery, abuse, and other social ills. It was, and still is to an extent, assumed that populations, or groups of selves, will more or less act to satisfy their own needs and desires. Levinas was uncomfortable with this, and recognized that many religious and non-Western philosophical traditions had a less self-centered view of people and the world. This includes the Abrahamic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, which all teach that we should not be selfish, and that we should connect with, have compassion for, and love others, even when they are not like us. Now this slide has a Bible verse, 
which tells us to love your neighbor like yourself, uh, which was both Hebraic and Christian. Uh, there's, there's this th thread going through the Quran. Humanity is but a single brotherhood, so make peace with your brothers. So not only is this teaching part of these religious traditions, it's a fundamentally core doctrine. Because knowing an other from the Western philosophical perspective is a kind of invasion or reshaping of their sense of self, Levinas suggested that we think of our encounters with others in terms of revelation. This image of the story of Moses and the burning bush illustrates this idea. God revealed himself to Moses and was entirely outside of Moses' control. Levinas said that seeing others as revealing themselves is to allow the other to be absolutely other, meaning that their existence is not necessarily dependent on ours. Incidentally, we capitalize the word other in this context to acknowledge that others are themselves and not merely a reflection of the self. So important is this idea of the other that Levinas pointed out that we can only develop a sense of self because of encounters with others. The first encounter all people have is with their mother and members of their family. Eventually, our knowledge of ourselves and our identity expands because of encounters with others. Similarly, societies develop their sense of culture through interactions with others, meaning other societies as well as the physical environment, including animals. For Levinas, the concept of the face is crucial because the face of the other reminds us that we are not the center of the universe, so to speak. It forces us to recognize that there is something beyond our sense of self, which was formed only because of we, we encountered others in the first place. The face of the other is what makes sensation, or an awareness of the world, possible. From this perspective, Levinas pointed out that if we think of the other as being entirely separate from ourselves, then that gives them not only the right to exist, but invites us to act ethically towards them and to even love them, because our own face calls others in the same way. I've included this painting of the Good Samaritan to illustrate this point, that we have a responsibility to treat others ethically and with compassion. For those who are not familiar with it, it is a biblical story told by Jesus in which a Jewish man is beaten at the side of the road and along comes a Samaritan, um, a distinct other for Jews, um, an outsider. Yet this Samaritan is moved by the face of the other, by the Jewish man, to act ethically and with compassion. And so he takes care of this man, or rather arranges to have the man taken care of. Of course, we struggle with this responsibility and sometimes even ignore it or rebel against it, which strains the sense of self and leads to all forms of violence and abuse. In media studies, literary studies, sociology, psychology, and other social sciences, Levinas's language is used to describe and analyze conflict or the ways in which societies and individuals seek to control and dominate others. On this level, the other is outsiders, or those who are not part of the mainstream, or not in power. This includes immigrants, other races and ethnic groups, people with disabilities, etc. Pages 348 and 349 in the College Success book list and briefly discusses the many different ways that the other can be defined, or what philosophers and social scientists call otherness. The book refers to these as different types of diversity, so make sure you get a good sense of these. This plays into the class in that media is a crucial component of culture that teaches and reinforces ideas, attitudes, and values about the other in ways we oftentimes don't perceive. Many of these messages reflect mainstream culture's biases towards the other. Some are overtly hostile, while some are more positive. Sometimes they have very complicated results. Here's a historical example. These images are of a Jewish-American actor named Al Jolson, who played an African-American character named Gus, a house slave that was smarter than his masters, making himself black by putting shoe polish on his skin and wearing an Afro wig. 
There was already a history of white actors playing in blackface, as it was called, and many of these portrayals were quite racist. Jolson played the character as a way to make fun of and criticize racism. In his real life, he was friends with many African Americans and demanded equal treatment for his fellow performers, no matter what the color of their skin. African Americans got this and embraced him. In fact, during the Harlem Renaissance, he was the only white person allowed in several all-black nightclubs. So Jolson had good intentions. However, his character reinforced some racist stereotypes about African Americans, and his performances participated in a racialized tradition that survives today. One disturbing tradition in some college fraternities is to have blackface parties that recall and replay aspects of our history and culture, such as slavery, lynchings, and racially motivated police brutality. In the media studies portions of the class, we'll pay attention to how the other is portrayed so that we can become sensitive to this issue and, I hope, become more mindful of the social justice issues in our world and try to do our part to make things better for the others among us, especially those of us who are in positions of privilege. All right, so that's a quick summary uh, of Levinas's ideas or the ones that are going to be important to us in the class. Um, so, yeah, for next class period, remember to read Chapter 9 of the College Success Book, The Social World of College, and I will see you Tuesday. Take care. I hope you have a great weekend and Monday.